Good morning. Uh, we today have a lucky and happy opportunity uh, to sit in the boardroom of the company International Wildlife Consultants, the directed by famous falconer in the world, Dr. Nick Fox. And uh, we are happy to ask Nick to tell us about his uh, path and way into world falconry. How that happened. Um, hello, my name is Nick Fox. I was born in Wiltshire, England in 1949. I'm married. I have a son, uh, Jamie, who's farming in New Zealand, and another son, Benjamin, who's in England. And none of my family were falconers. Uh, my father was a vicar. I got my first dog when I was a week old and he was a Springer crossed collie and he cost us a shilling so we called him Bobby because Bob is short for shilling in English and so all my childhood as I grew up I grew up with Bobby I got my first falcon um, I was interested in fact, I made my first hoods when I was nine or ten, but I didn't get my first falcon till I was about fifteen, and that was a kestrel called Mayfly. And that was at school, I was away at boarding school in, in um, Surrey in England at, at that time. Um, then later I had a haggard female goshawk. And then a number of birds over the years. In those days you could easily import birds from India. You could get a lugger falcon for um, a few pounds. I had a hawk eagle called Odd Job, which cost a few pounds. But they all had broken feathers and riddled with coccidiosis and that kind of thing. You had to treat them and molt them. But you couldn't easily get peregrines then. <clears throat> it was that um, when I started in the 60s, pesticides were still very much in use. So all the birds of prey were very depressed and uh, one couldn't get hold of things like peregrines. So we flew imported birds or native birds such as um, sparrowhawks. My best man, David Norris, gave me a Jack Merlin as, as um, a wedding present. He'd been hacked in Dublin. The Merlin had been hacked in Dublin and we drove around Ireland on our honeymoon hawking with the Merlin. And eventually, when I got back up to Scotland when I was at University at St Andrews, we hacked him back on Humphrey Evans's estate up near Perth. Um, so I didn't have a background in falconry. I had to teach myself. I didn't meet a falconer till I was, oh, I think about 19. Um, there were no courses in those days. You couldn't buy falconry equipment very easily. You could buy bells in Lahore, but that was a major job, trying to send money to Lahore and get things back. Um, so we had to make all of our own gloves, swivels, bells, jesses, hawking bags, hoods, weighing scales, perches, everything really. There was no way just to go and buy them. So I've, I've always made my own gloves. I've never used a glove made by somebody else. Um, so when I left school, um, I went to St Andrews University and did zoology in Scotland and I took my hawks there and hawked in Fife 
And at that time, we wanted to reintroduce goshawks to Britain. So um, I trained a goshawk, I trained a male goshawk called Nipper, I think it was. And after he'd caught about 50 or 60 head in, in the autumn, I released him on Speyside as part of a project with the late Doug Weir. And at that time we also hacked out um, young goshawks from Sweden into Argyle. And my wife and I were over there in the summer uh, hacking them out from artificial nests. Um, so the goshawk got established and I trained a few when I was younger. Uh, I think I trained four or five and I published their hunting results in, um, in at a conference on understanding the goshawk. After I'd been to St Andrews, I did teacher training in Dundee. I carried on hawking. I've carried on hawking. I've had a hawk all my, essentially all my life since I was in my teens, apart from when I'm actually emigrating somewhere. Um, so after teacher training, I got a scholarship from the Draper's Company in London and I went to New Zealand to do a doctorate on the biology of the New Zealand falcon, which took me four years. I was in the Southern Alps and we had a farm in North Canterbury and I trained haggard and young New Zealand falcons and I was the first to breed them in captivity. And the good thing was because the species wasn't really studied, it meant I could study all aspects of it. I could look at morphology, taxonomy, breeding behaviour, hunting behaviour, pesticides, um, diet, uh, everything. So I got an all-round training in the biology of a species, which is very handy because nowadays you tend to learn more and more about less and less till you know everything about nothing. You know, you get so specialised, it isn't worth, you know, to, you need a good rounded education. Um, just looking at Yevgeny's questions. Um, when uh, I was about 18, I went to Philip Glazier's, who was just uh, opening his centre, and I went there for two or three weeks and helped build Avery's and that kind of thing. He taught me some things like, like his way of swinging a, a lure, <clears throat> which he said was passed down from um, the old hawking club people. Uh, and I got to know a few more falconers. I joined the British Falconers Club. Um, but I've always lived in remote places, so I haven't really had much to do with other falconers. Um, even here in West Wales, there's never really been a functioning group of the British Falconers Club. Um, so I've written a couple of books on falconry, one on understanding the bird of prey and one on crow hawking. I've also written um, um, a book in English and Arabic on strategies for the conservation of falcons and of hubara. And I've made some films on raptor management. Um, so, yeah, over the years, I suppose I've trained, um, I've trained a shikra, Sparrowhawk, several sparrowhawks, goshawks. I've hunted with Japanese sparrowhawks in China and Japan, but not trained them. Um, common buzzards, red tails, Harris hawks, um, 
Kestrel of Merlins, Aplomado Falcons, um, not properly. Uh, New Zealand Falcons, I've trained about 17 or 18 of them. Um, a lot of big falcons. <coughs> um, not sure how many, maybe 120, 100 and something. Uh, mainly Jer, Jer Saker hybrids, Jers, Jer Peregrines, Peregrines, Sakers, Peregrine Sakers, and New Zealand Peregrines and New Zealand Jers, or I should say the other way around, Jer New Zealands. Um, one or two hawk eagles. Never trained big eagles. They haven't. They, they've never done anything for me. The landscape in Britain, I don't think, is suitable. An eagle belongs high in the sky. Flying them off the fist doesn't do anything for me. I've had horses all my life, <clears throat> and have hunted traditional fox hunting off and on for years. Um, I was, well I still am, um, scientific advisor to the all-party parliamentary middle way group on hunting with dogs and I did, um, I've done a study on welfare aspects of trapping vertebrates and also one on um, wounding rates in shooting foxes. So we've looked at the ethics of hunting sports. <clears throat> um, what else? You have been involved in uh, conservation of Mauritius Kestrel together with Wildlife Preser uh, Preservation Trust with Gerald Darrell. Could you tell a little bit about this? Yeah, part? in... Um, right. In 1984, that year, I had, I've had i had um, five generations of German wirehead pointers. And in 1984, we had two bitches produce 20 puppies between them, two days apart. And in the autumn of 84, um, we were due to go out to Mauritius. So we had to rear and sell those that summer so the place was like a permanent meet of hounds that summer and also that summer um, I had a I was handed um, a female peregrine that had been caught being smuggled and had to be hacked back and I had to repair her with a lot of glue so I called her Errol Dighty and we hacked her out at Carrigkenin so we'd finally got Aroditi and all of the puppies off our hands and we set off to Mauritius for four months, uh, funded by the P Peregrine Fund, uh, Tom Cade's um, organisation in America. And we worked there, that was my wife and I and a field assistant, Tom Bailey, um, together with my stepdaughter, Cecilia, for some of the time. And we worked with Carl Jones, who was doing um, work on, on the kestrels and also on the echo parakeets and the pink pigeons. We uh, trapped, um, I think, about seven Mauritius kestrels and I put um, radio tags on the tails. And then we did time budgets and followed them all around the forest as they hunted to see what bits and areas of the habitat they used. And as a result, we found, we, we, we um, built up a map of the home ranges of adjacent pairs. And by the end, we estimated there were about 50 wild kestrels which didn't suit the conservationists because they wanted them to be rare so that they get grants to study them. So we, we did, um, we, we produced a study on the um, predation ecology of the Mauritius kestrel, which I think is online at the moment. 
Um, that was very interesting and since then the kestrel through captive breeding and supplementary feeding is doing fine. Um, what about red kites? Because everyone can see above your farm soaring red kites every hour. Okay, so for red kites, um, in the, that, that same time in the 80s, the mid 80s, the red kite um, was down to about 25 pairs in Britain. And um, people were stealing the eggs, egg collectors were stealing the eggs. And um, they had Gurkhas guarding the nests so uh, and each nest only produced one chick if it was lucky from three eggs so I said to the kite committee why don't you take the eggs bring them to me leave dummies in the nest I'll hatch them out and then when the chicks are almost ready to fly we'll put them back out and we'll increase productivity and so they came down here and they looked at what we were doing with the falcons, breeding falcons. And after a couple of years, when all the licenses were sorted out, they started bringing us eggs. And I could always tell if somebody brought me a kite egg, because my office is upstairs and the incubation room is downstairs. I could smell in my office if a kite egg had come into the building. They were that smelly. Anyway, we started hatching them out. And then I'd ring up the field workers and say, uh, well, we, we foster reared them under imprint buzzards who looked after them very well. And um, then I'd ring up the field workers and say, right, I've got two chicks ready to go out next week. Have you got a nest ready? They'd come and pick them up. Then they'd take the chicks to the kite nest where the one remaining egg had produced a chick and that had been reared. But then we found that my two chicks, putting back with its sibling, were twice the size of the one that was still in the nest. So then we started to realize that actually these kites were struggling for food, they were under food stress. They were feeding their young kites the rotten lamb tails with the rubber ring still on and then they're getting impacted gizzards and so on. <coughs> So then I said, well, what's the point of putting kites back into an area where you know they're under food stress? Why don't you start on a new area, such as Devon or somewhere, or at least put them on the periphery of the current distribution so that they spread out onto new ground? So after a while, I started putting them on the periphery, and then, then after three or so years, people realised that you could actually hatch and rear kites, you could manage kites. I mean, I'm a farmer, you tell me how many kites you want and you breed them. So, uh, so then they wanted them in England and Scotland. Fine. But then the Welsh didn't want to give Welsh kites to the English. <laughs> So anyway, in the end, we sourced some kites in, in Spain for England and in Sweden for Scotland. And <clears throat> then they discovered that even if they were government, they still had to do quarantine and all the rest. So I drew up the plans for them to design a quarantine facility that would last the quarantine period, but when you opened it, it would also be a hack box for the kites to go out and that was done in the Chilterns so the first site we did was I think it was on um, the Getty estate near Stoken Church and as it happened I had a couple of Welsh young Welsh kites and the field workers didn't have a nest ready so I I took them in the old Cortina and I took them to Stoke and Church and put them in the pens before the Spanish kites came. And after that, I told the kite committee in Wales that two kites had gone from Wales to England. Anyway, the years went by. We did 53 kites here. And then I stopped because it was all going fine. 
and after a few years I came off the kite committee because everybody was doing it. There's plenty of kites. I moved on to other things. Meanwhile, um, we were working on sakers in um, Kazakhstan, Mongolia, China, um, Kyrgyzstan, Siberia, and um, we were doing that for the Environment Agency in Abu Dhabi. My head of research then was Eugene Potapov, and then later, the last years, was Andrew Dixon. And we surveyed sakers to find out their general distribution and numbers. We linked up with various institutes in those countries and um, employed uh, local scientists and students. Um, we organised a number of conferences in different countries, including one in Mongolia entirely in yurts, <laughs> which was quite fun, because the university was a very run-down building. Um, then, it's one thing studying something, it's another thing doing something about it. <clears throat> and people were saying, well, the sakers are being over-harvested for Arab falconry, da-da-da-da-da. Whether they were or not, we didn't know. So <clears throat> when you're working with animals, one of the things you've got to do is to ask the animal questions. And you've got to work out what question can you ask where you can realistically get a, an answer from them? <clears throat> so I wanted to put out artificial nests. So the first question to ask was, what kind of artificial nest do sakers actually like? And we tried out different sorts of um, barrels and tripods and so on out on the step. For three years we tried different types. Eventually we came up with a design that was practical and which they liked. <clears throat> so then we put up 5,000 of them at two kilometre intervals in various study areas. And over the years the numbers built up until after about four years, I think we were producing about 2,300 young sakers and... Um, even more kestrels, quite a few buzzards, a few ravens, even some eagles. And um, so there were, we could show that there were uh, a lot of sakers who actually were floating around but didn't have a nest site. And you give them a nest site and you suddenly find there's a lot more sakers than you think there are. <clears throat> the plan had been that, uh, and we microchipped a lot of those sakers, uh, the plan had been that we could then, um, the, the Mongolian government could then sell permits for some of our sakers and we could show CITES that it was a sustainable use system. Well, we got all the biology right, but the politics weren't right. The, the government kept changing and... Um, they started giving permits, but they wouldn't tell CITES what they were doing. Uh, we also formed um, a schools links program, linking Mongolian schools to British, American and Middle Eastern schools. And the reason for that was because for, to get the local Mongolians to understand the point of all the nest barrels around the place, to get to the adults, the only real way was to get the children where they were together at school and teach the children. Um, so we did that. We, we put satellite tags on sakers and peregrines. We also, um, together with the Beijing Institute um, for Genetics, we, um, we analysed the genome of the peregrine, the saker and the ger falcon. We got interesting results from the Calidus peregrines in the Arctic, 
showing how they migrated south and what areas they depended on for wintering and migrating. Um, before that, back in New Zealand, I formed the Raptor Association to pull together falconers, rehabbers and scientists such as there were on birds of prey. And that continued for about 30 years. Uh, and then it's become now my old friends Noel Hyde and Debbie Stewart in New Zealand um, set up a centre which we've been supporting called Wingspan. Um, while we were doing the research in Asia, we formed in 1994 the Middle East Falcon Research Group and that kept going for was it 21 years or something, mm -hmm. something like that, 21, 22 years, um, linking biologists and veterinarians. So, for example, if we put microchips in sakers, when some of those wild sakers got... Um, uh, shipped to the Gulf and people brought them into the vet hospitals, the vets could detect the microchips and report them and we get some idea of the harvest rate of the wild falcons. And that's, that continued for quite a long time till eventually the funding for the Asian research was stopped. The Environment Agency was cutting budgets. <coughs> Meanwhile, in 1991, I've been hawking every year and training falcons. <coughs> I tried grouse hawking, but I didn't really like it. Game hawking doesn't appeal to me very much. Um, when it goes really well, it's kind of boring, and when it doesn't go very well, it's people disappearing over moors trying to get their hawks back. Um, I like to see some good aerial chases. So, um, crows have been one of my main quarries. And in 91, we started crow hawking in the Scottish borders on horses. And in 92, we formed the Northumberland Crow Falcons, which is still going now. Um, yeah, again, he's pushing a book at me. Um, we meet two or three times a week from a farm in Northumberland and we hawk all around Northumberland and we have about 20 members uh, and we hawk through August and September. This is, this is a book from last season one of our members made. And nowadays it's gone all modern and we, we, um, we have a Facebook page so the hunting reports go on the Facebook page and um, lots of photos go on the Facebook page but we've also kept diaries through all the years so we know how many visitors have been out, how many flights, which falcons and so on. But then... <clears throat> After about 20 or more years of doing that, to train a crow falcon, it's very like training a falcon for Hubara flights, um, a bagged quarry is illegal in Britain and I don't use it. So you've got to work out how can you train a young falcon to chase crows, which are quite fierce. Um, you've got to teach the falcon to be fit, you've got to it's got to learn how to fly, it's got to be wedded to the black crow, not go chasing pheasants or pigeons or anything else. Um, so how do you do that without a real crow? So <clears throat> what I really wanted was um, a crow that would do what it's told. So we developed a robotic crow. Uh, we started off with a big robotic hubara and then our second model is a crow um, but it can also be many other species such as herring gulls, grouse, partridges, mallard or it can even be a goshawk or a peregrine which you can use for chasing off 
goals for pest control. So then we were able to start training falcons with our robotic crows and that made life an awful lot easier. My old falcons got a lot better, we got much more high flights, they take on crows on passage a lot further and higher than they used to. 